Good evening, good evening, good evening to each and every one of you. I pray that you have had a blessed day on today, and we thank God for yet another opportunity to be able to come into the house of, well, into each and every one of your homes uh, to study uh, God's word uh, again. He has given us this opportunity, and we just thank him for it. I don't have any announcements that have been given to me today. So we will just pray and go directly into the word. There's a whole lot we need to talk about today. You know, we can ever finish it, this one chapter in one day. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for another day. We thank you for allowing us, Lord God, to see the uh, sun rise this morning. Now, Father God, you've allowed us to come over in the evening, Lord God. We don't know, Lord God, well, whether we will see the night through or not, Lord God. Only you know that. But, Father, we trust you and we believe you. And we know that whatever happens, uh, we are in your capable hands, Lord God, and that everything will uh, work out just fine. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that uh, you know our ins and our outs, Lord God. Father, you know uh, what was going to happen, Lord God, even before it happens, Father God. And we thank you, Lord God, that we know that you have our best interest at heart, Lord God. And you told us that no matter what may happen, Lord God, you said that all things will work together. Uh, 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 they will work together for our good, Lord God, according to your purpose, Father. And so we thank you for that right now in Jesus' name. Father, we come right now lifting up all of those, Lord God, that are in the hospitals. We lift up grieving families everywhere, Lord God, that are, are grieving the loss of a loved one. Father, we ask right now, Lord God, that you would keep them, Lord God. Hold them in the palm of your hand, Lord God, and we just thank you, Lord God, for doing just that. Then, Father, we ask right now that you would uh, bless every pastor, Lord God. Uh, we pray right now, Lord God, that we know that you say you will give pastors according to your heart. So, Father God, every church right now, Lord God, we pray and lift them up. We lift up their pastor. Father God, we pray right now. We thank you, Lord God, for uh, allowing them, Lord God, to have time to uh, delve into your word, to study your word, Lord God. So uh, on Sunday morning or either uh, whenever this Bible study or whatever they are bringing forth the word, Lord God, that you allow them, Lord God, to spend time, Lord God, so they'll be able to feed your sheep. We thank you for that. Then, Father God, we... um. Just thank you for this opportunity because we don't take it lightly, Lord, because we know that uh, it could have been the other way. Father, we just thank you again. We thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you for your tender mercy. We just thank you, Lord God, for delivering us. Thank you for saving us, Lord God. Thank you for bringing us out of darkness into the marvelous light. We love you. We bless you. And we praise you. It's all in the mighty, the magnificent in the holy name of Jesus Christ, we do pray this prayer. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. I thank God yet for uh, another day, another opportunity for us to get back into this word. So uh, um, last week we left off, we finished uh, up with chapter four. And so uh, remember how we started talking about when very first part of uh, in the book of Ephesians, Paul started telling us what we have in Christ. And, 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 and as I stated before, so many of us don't know what we have in Christ. But now that we have, and, and what Paul essence and what he was saying is that, okay, now you have all of this. You know that you have it. So there is a certain way that you need to walk. So in chapter four, we, he started telling us how we ought to walk. He said that we ought to walk worthy of the calling because we saw the different calls that he uh, uh, told us about. Uh, in the, I think it was maybe probably around, uh, maybe first chapter when he was telling us about, you know, the callings that we have. But now Paul went on and he was telling us how we ought to walk worthy. He told us that we need to walk in unity. Remember, we saw that back in chapter four. Uh, he told us that we ought to walk not only in love and unity, but we ought to walk in truth and in holiness. And so 
not only that, Paul is continuing in the fifth chapter. Uh, that he's going to continue the, uh, uh, liking this Christian uh, journey or uh, our, our Christian life as a walk. And how do we walk? What, taking one step at a time. So that is, and then when you, uh, uh, because we're going to see here in, in, in uh, throughout the book of Ephesians, we, you know, we've been seeing the word walk, walk, walk. And uh, so that lets me know that it is a continuous thing. In other words, as long as we've got breath in our bodies, that means that we need to continue to do and to strive to do the things of God. And I like the way Paul is starting off um, because he's telling us again uh, this evening how we need to learn how to walk. And he's giving us three more ways that we need to walk. We need to walk in love. We need to walk in light. We need to walk as light, rather. And we need to walk as wise. And so we're going to be looking at walking in love uh, first thing off. And uh, let's look at um, uh, verse, uh, well, uh, chapter 5, begin at verse 1. We're going to, uh, I'm going to read the first seven verses. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks." For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covenous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them." Oh, my God, my God, my God. That's a whole lot what Paul uh, is, is, is telling us. In other words, as I just stated, all that, all who we are in, uh, uh, you know, all we are in Christ and all that we have in Christ, then now he wanted, uh, uh, so he's telling us how we need to continue to walk. Okay, if you got these things, how do you need to walk? First of all, he said that in, in, in the very first verse, in the King James Version, it said to be therefore followers of God. But in the Amplified and in other uh, versions, it said be imitators. And what is an imitator? Somebody that mimics, uh, want to be like somebody. So this, in other words, you copy him, you know. Uh, you know, we have our children go, I want to be like Mike. I want to be like this. I want to be like that. You never hear anybody say, I want to be like Christ. So I want to be like God. So this is what the scripture is telling us. Said, be ye therefore be imitators of God. He didn't say try to be God. No, we cannot be omniscient. We cannot be omnipresent. We can't not be omniscient. We can't be everywhere all at the same time. We don't have all power and um we uh, so we and we just we don't I mean we can't do that. He's not saying try to be God, but he is saying pattern yourself after God. Do the things where he and one thing that we're gonna see in this lesson is that God loved. And we're not talking about just any kind of love because I found out that you know we use that word loosely. I know some of the um um uh, uh languages uh, they have different words uh, for like love, but in the English language, we use love for everything. You know, a uh, uh, a husband or a man tells his a uh, husband tells his wife, or a wife tells her husband, or a man tells uh, the uh, the woman that he is dating, or the woman that she's dating the man. They will say, "I love you," but then we'll turn around and say, "Oh, I love chocolate cake." 
Uh, I love me some ice cream. So you know what? There has got to be a difference between that kind of love. And so God is not talking about just regular love because you know what? With us nowadays, we use that word very loosely. We have no regard for the word love at all. But the love that we're going to see that God is talking about or that Paul is talking about in this lesson is that agape type love. And so let's look here when he was telling us, we're going to see the different ways too that um, we can imitate. And he told us to do what? He said to um, be imitators of God and follow his example as well beloved children. So he wasn't trying to, he didn't tell us to try to be God. He said to be an imitator. You got to follow him. They're just like our uh, children. Children are known uh, for imitating their parents. And you know, it's nothing wrong with that. It's natural for a child to try to emulate or to uh, copy or uh, imitate their, their uh, parent. Uh, most little boys, when they grow up, they want to be like their daddy. Or the girls want to be like their mom. You will find the girls... Uh, Putting on, because I know we used to put on my, my mom's shoes when we were growing up. You know, we would, um, uh, the girl, uh, girls, we would fight over almost. I want to put on her shoes. I want to wear them. So that is just wanting to be like your parent. And so, but you know, like I say, it's nothing wrong with that. Because after all, that's how children learn everything they know. Now we see how why, how this world has gotten in such a, 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 a you know a bad shape because people children are watching the adults. Maybe it might not be a parent per se, but it is somebody that is putting time in with that child. They are watching that person's walk. So he told uh, 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 Paul is telling us that um, we ought to be imitators of God. And like I say, a child learn everything uh, from their parents. They learn how to brush their teeth. They learn how to, uh, even when they're through playing with their toys, they learn how to go and to put them up. Uh, uh, and they, you know, they even learn how to treat other people with respect because they've seen their people, uh, their parents or whoever, they're under their careful watch. They are watching them and they see how they treat others. And the same way when you find kids with bad attitudes, nine out of 10, most of the time when you go, you know, and I'm not saying that all the time that this does happen, but primarily children are looking at their parents and they are mimicking what they do. This is what Paul is saying then. Uh, so I want you um, to mimic God. I want you to imitate him. In other words, we can't imitate God uh, through our own power. It just, it just, it just can't happen. So uh, because it's just like we can't be holy on our own because uh, uh, as redeemed children of God, we have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to live like him, to act like him, to walk like him, to talk like him. In other words, God has empowered us and enabled us to live holy lives for his glory. It's not through anything that we can do. We have been empowered through the Holy Spirit to walk like God, to emulate him. And so, uh, uh, as I said, it's not trying to be God, but we are we're imitating his walk. And you want to know how God walked in, watch what Christ, you know, we see everything that has been recorded of what Christ did. So the son points us what? To the father. So that's what we need to do. And so here, uh, Paul had just, uh, you know, as I uh, was stating about last week when we were talking in um, chapter four, Paul was telling us uh, some of the things that we had to pull off. But he always, you know, just like the scripture always tells us, if we put off something or pull off something, you're going to put on something else. I think like last week I was saying when we get ready to uh, to lay down at night and if we pull off, uh, you know, these clothes that we have on night, we, uh, now we, then we'll put, uh, we pull off these 
but we put on night clothes. So that's the same way that Paul likened that. He said, put off the old. And once you pull that off, I want you to put on something new. Uh, and, and, and so not only did he tell them, the, uh, see, he detailed the ways that they were supposed to do that. And he ended up by saying that we ought to love others by walking in forgiveness. That's the way he ended chapter four. He said, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you, we've got to learn how to walk in forgiveness. And that is imitating a uh, God walking in forgiveness. And it said, uh, so how can we going to see now then how we can imitate God? How can we imitate God? The primary way that uh, we can imitate God is by what? By walking in love. Isn't that what he said? And walk in love as Christ hath loved us. And not only did, uh, uh, did he love us, but what did Christ do? He gave himself for us. In other words, that type of love that Christ had for us, he loved us so much that he gave his life for us. He, I mean, that is it. We're talking about, like I said, not any just ordinary type of love, but we are talking about the agape type of love, not the love that love uh, in, uh, because of. I love you because, you know what, you love me, you're good to me, but I love you what, in spite of. And we're going to see, even when Paul said, we got to love people even in spite of the person. We may not love the things that they do, but we still got to love that person. And Paul, he went on, he was telling us that uh, we got to, he said that we've got to walk, walk with in good works. We got to walk worthy of the calling that we have received. Because, you know, remember last week when he was, uh, last uh, week, we talked about he when he was saying that don't walk, you know, we should not be walking no more as the Gentiles do. But we've got to learn to walk in love. In other words, walk as children of light. There is a difference between light and darkness. And our uh, light always dispels darkness. Why do you think a lot of times uh, when you walk around and you get around certain people, you know, they will scatter because what? They see you coming and they know what type of a uh, spirit you carry. And they just, you know, they, they want to, you know, we're going to see what even he talked about, even when they're telling all these little dirty jokes and things like that, we can't be a part of that. And then, you know, we go on, you go on the job and when they start doing these kind of things and you walk away, you don't want no parts of that. And they know that you don't want parts. So they'll be in a little huddle, but when they see you coming in, then they, they all just, you know, everybody, they disperse. They go, you know, they're separate their ways. And sometimes you wonder, well, what is wrong with me? That it seems like nobody wants to be around me is because you carry the spirit of God. Never think, you know, it's, it has nothing to do with you per se, just yourself. It's because of who you carry. You carry the spirit of God in you. So that's a good thing. You know, I would rather... Uh, for them to be running away from me because I carry the spirit of God and therefore it to be something else simply because uh, that's all, you know, I'm the one telling all the dirty jokes and, 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 uh, and time you see me coming, you're running away because you don't want to hear them, but no, they're running away from you because you what you got the spirit of God on the inside of you. And not only do you talk it, but what you live it, you walk this thing out. And this is what Paul is saying that this daily, uh, uh, um, this Christian life is what it's a walk. In other words, it, 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 it's a daily thing. We can't just do it one time and then put it down. No, we have to constantly, uh, continue to do it. Uh, um, you know, for the rest of our days. Uh, and so, as I said before, this type of love that uh, Paul is talking about here, the primary way that we can uh, imitate God is by love. And we got to love those that don't even love us because the Bible says that God is love. And so 
God loved us even before we even loved him. Uh, and look in, the, uh, in that phrase where it says for us and walk, uh, where is it? And loved, uh, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself what for us. He didn't do it for himself. He did it for us. It said for us. And, and and so it comes from this Greek word, uh, huper, H-U-P-E-R. And it, in other words, it's talking about a substitutionary type of love. Uh, in other words, Christ went to the cross as our substitute. It may instead of or in behalf of, when he talked about for us, that's what it's talking about. He went instead of us, us he went on our behalf. It does not mean just Christ just merely died for us for our benefit. It's even more than that. He died instead of us. He went in our place. He substituted himself for us. And that's something to say. In other words, he was willing to go to receive the full punishment for sin, because the Bible says that he who knew no sin, he became sin, what, for us. He never sinned, but we did. So what? that's what Christ did. He went and took our place. He took it, so he, he substituted himself for us. In other words, he went uh, in our place, or he did it instead of us. He substituted himself for us. So instead of us receiving the full impact of the divine wrath, because what? God is holy. And so he can stand the sight of sin. And so instead of us receiving the divine wrath of God, Christ would do what? He was willing to substitute himself for just for us. So that we would not have to receive the divine wrath of God. See, if we die and go to hell, it has nothing to do with God. Because God sent his son, Jesus. And Jesus took the uh, penalty. Uh, uh, he took away that penalty of sin for us. But if we really want to go and we want that divine wrath, it will come upon us. And then uh, go on and let's look at, uh, that was verse two. He said, he gave himself as an offering, as a sacrifice. And we know that a sacrifice, even in the Old Testament, God always required what? A sacrifice for sin. And uh, in the Old Testament, they always brought a lamb uh, without blemish. Uh, either, you know, whatever is according to what the per, uh, people had. If they did not have a, a, a lamb, then they would bring some type of dove or any type of uh, animal that was spotless, didn't have no kind of disease or any type of uh, uh, ailments or anything like that. But they always had to place it upon the altar uh, and they had to offer it up as a sacrifice. And as that sacrifice, the sweet smell of the aroma would go up to God Excuse me, and it would be pleasing in what in God's nostril, and so that's the way it was when Christ offered Himself as a sacrifice for us. He went in our place. He offered Himself up to God as a sacrifice, and what He did—that's why when He rose up, He had to go up, and what He had to take it up uh, to God. And place it on the mercy seat. And God accepted that sacrifice. It was well pleasing to him. And then let's go on how we imitate God. We imitate God by doing what? Look in verse 3. By abstaining from what? Oh, several impurities. Let's look at verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness of covenants, let it not be once named among you as becoming saints. He didn't stop there. He said, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. It's time out for all this old foolishness now. He, uh, the, uh, I like the international version. It translated this way. He said, but among you, there must not be even a hint 
of sexual immorality, of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. He didn't just say for God's people, but he said for God's holy people. And when we are holy, we can't do any and everything. If we can still do any and everything, then we need to go back because there is something wrong. Because uh, 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 Paul was just simply em uh, emphasizing here that sexual impurities and covetousness should not ever be a part of the Christian life. But it's sad to say that nowadays, Christian, you know, we are uh, so many of us, and even as believers, we have abandoned the belief that uh, Christians can live life differently than the world. That's why sometimes now we can't even tell the uh, can't tell the Christians from the world because what we're living just like the world. But I beg the differ we can because what God has shown us, he has given us his word. But if we never spend time in his word, we do not know what his word is saying. And so uh, so he's telling us that as, as, as believers and as Christians, we should not ever be caught up in sexual immorality. Uh, uh, it, it's, it, that is just not the way uh, uh, that God wants it to be. Uh, but it, it, you know, according to his word. And so, but the reason for, uh, for this holiness that Paul advocated in is that because we are saints, there should be a difference between us and the world. But as I stated before, we're doing everything that the world is doing. So, you know, it's kind of hard to tell. In other words, when you talk about the word saint, that denotes a separation. It is the nature of a saint to separate from the uh, from the sin that the world lives in. You know, but so many of us now, you know, like you say, you can't tell us apart because we are doing any and everything nowadays. But we can't do that. We've got to allow God's word uh, to do what? To lead us, to guide us into all truth. And he said, but... Uh, immoral, sexual, all impurity. In other words, lust. You know, some of us, you know, we say, well, I'm not doing, I'm not uh, caught up in no uh, sexual immorality. Might as well be, because that's all your mind stay on. And that's what he's saying. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I uh, remember last week we talked about that too. We're saying that uh, if a, um, um, your man look upon a woman and he lust. After her in his heart, he never touched her. He never had any type of sex or, or, or confrontation with her, but he lust after her as if it had already happened. So you what you lust in your heart. So you might say it's as if you have already done it. And this is what Paul is saying. We can't have thoughts and things like that. But you know why? A lot of times, well, you, that's why we have to watch what we allow our eyes to look upon. We got to watch what our ears hear. Then we got to watch the things that's coming out of our mouths. You know, we think that we can sit up and watch uh, pornography all day long and it not uh, affect us. Yes, it will affect us. That's why, and then you're going to sit up and listen to all type of music. And some of this music, all of this cursing that's in it and, uh, and, and, and I'm watching movies about homosexuality and all of these kind of things. Some things that we as believers, we just can't watch. Uh, what? Because as I said before, we always got to watch, uh, watch what we uh, uh, allow our eyes to gaze upon. We need to watch what, what our ears listen to. And uh, then we need to watch the things that come out of our mouths because you know all of this you know even paul was talking about here uh in in in, in verse four when he was talking about filthiness uh he said let there be no filthiness in other words obscenity indecency you know some of us can still curse like we did when we was out there in the world 
uh, and, and so in it, nor foolish and sinful, silly, corrupt talk, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting. Uh, it's not becoming to be coming out of a saint's mouth. Nobody want to hear a uh, uh, the pastor just get through uh, uh, cussing and carrying on and calling say all kind of words. You don't want to hear a man of God get through doing that and again get up there and going to give you the word. It's a blessings and curses are not to come out of the same mouth. You know, so we've got to learn who we are and we've got to do what? We've got to walk accordingly as to who we are. See the... Uh, the New Revised Standard Version, it translates this verse as what? Uh, entirely out of place is obscene, silly, and vulgar talk. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. And you know how sometimes people can come and they can have some of the worst uh, vulgar vocabulary and obscene uh, uh uh, because the, the the NIV said that uh, have it this way, nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. And no, he's not. Paul is was saying that. Um. Uh uh uh. He's not saying that you know we should not you know we don't you know we shouldn't be joking. There is such thing as having clean fun, and clean joking. But when it gets to all of this vulgar uh, talking and this and that, we should not want to be a part of it. Because this is what Paul was saying. Paul was saying that Thanksgiving is the opposite of the filthiness, the foolish talking, and the inappropriate justin that, uh, uh, you know, like he was just, he, you know, he's condemning that. But see, Thanksgiving takes humility. And see, proud people aren't thankful. They only think of themselves. All the things Paul was condemning in these verses are rooted in selfishness. So if the uh, motive is to bless others, then jesting will always be appropriate and not the type Paul was rebuking here. And so in other words, he, uh, uh, Paul is not rebuking how sometimes we can get together and we can have nice, clean fun and we can joke. It's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, when when we've got to, uh, as my mom used to call it, talking under a person's clothes and all of this type of stuff. That, I mean, we should not even want to be around that. We should not even want to, uh, uh, you know, be in the midst of, of, of that that is going on. You know, because, you know, once you come out of that, you don't want no parts of it anymore. And so this is what Paul is saying hear that we've got to come out from among them he said for this you know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covenant man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of christ and i know uh one of the main false teachings of paul's uh during that day um was uh they called the gnostics and they taught that the indulgence of sinful appetites meant nothing. They said, it's okay. It's all right. Because the inner man, because your inner spirit is pure. And it is true that we as believers, our inner spirit, you know, as I say, you know, Paul said the old passed away of whole, all things become new. Our spirit man becomes new. The spirit cannot sin, but we still have the same eyes, the same hands, the same feet. We can still choose to go wrong places. We can still choose to do the wrong thing, but we still, because of what, what our, our, our spirit, uh, because of our, what our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotion has not been changed. The a new man, your spirit man became a new man. So once we truly believe and accept Christ, the spirit cannot sin, but our soul can, if that makes sense to you. Our mind, our will, and our emotions. And that's what we, we go by. We no longer listen to the spirit. And then the spirit cannot talk when we're not spending any time in the word and allowing uh, the Holy Spirit to minister to us. That's why we find ourselves, you know, living the same old way. Nothing 
change. We'll find that, you know, when we first get saved and we start trying to live for Christ, but see, we try to do it out of ourselves and, and, uh, and don't allow the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will only uh, uh, move in us when what? When we feed the Spirit of God. We feed it through the Word, spending time in the Word of God, allowing, uh, uh, we read the Word, uh, 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 talk to God, and allowing him to talk back to us. But if we never do those things, then the spirit man is just laying dormant. We are steadily feeding our souls, our mind, our wills, and our emotions. And we are feeding them the things of the world. And it uh, and this is what makes them be so, in, you know, uh, in other words, it's like they just taken over. And so... But Paul makes it very clear in this passage that we are not to live in sin. He said the whoremongers, the unclean, and the covenants are, are, are idolaters. And so idolaters do not have Christ as their God. And they also don't have a place in God's kingdom. So we don't want to be like that. In other words, uh, you know, we say that we worship in God, but really and truly we're not. We just saying it what in word, but our life ought to be speaking it. See, uh, 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 on the surface, this verse may look contrary to the grace that Paul was teaching in other places, but that's not so. For one thing, there is a difference between a person who commits an act of whoredom and then a whoremonger. See, the word whoremonger, uh, uh, uh. It's the same as unclean and covenant. It's describing uh, the character or the nature of a person. Uh, 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 but uh, the dictionary defines character as the combination of qualities of features that distinguishes one person, one group or thing from another. So Paul was saying here that those who are by nature whoremongers, those who are by nature unclean, and covenants, and uh, they don't have any inheritance in the kingdom of God. But any person that uh, uh, is walking uh, in the spirit, that is walking, uh, you know, that have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we should not be walking in these things. Sure, you know, there's a difference between a person maybe slipping up, you know, and 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 do this. But to just constantly, uh, that's why it said whoremongers. I mean, that's a, I mean, to, to you, that's a lifestyle. And see what Paul is saying, our lifestyle should have changed. We still are not to be walking in those things that we were walking in before we got saved. And so Christian, as I just said, you know, before, so as, uh, as believers, you can and sometimes do. Uh, commit sexual sin and they operate in covenants, but it's not their nature. It should not be our nature to do these things. Uh, but Paul listed these sin sins, uh, but he went on to say, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, but you are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, uh, and you may, uh, when you first got slave, saved, you might have been slipping up, but each and every day you ought to be what? Getting stronger and stronger. We are not to be making those same mistakes that we were making 10, 15, 20 years ago. To be honest, we should, should, should not even be making the same mistakes that we were making last year. Because what? Each and every day we ought to be what? Growing more and more. But uh, so that is what verse five is not to say that it is it's unimportant to live holy. We've got to live holy. And then I'm saying not saying that we cannot have fun, but we've got to learn how to have clean fun. Uh, uh, because, you know, some of the things that we do and we can call it fun, it's just not acceptable in God's eyesight. And there are sometimes, and we're going to even see where 
uh, Paul was saying, you know what? We got to come out even from among people like that. Let's go on. Let's look at verse. Uh, Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Oh, my God, my God, my God. Notice that God's wrath is said comes on the children of disobedience. In other words, uh, this talking about uh, people that are not say God's wrath is reserved for his enemies. It's reserved for his enemies. But if we acting like the enemy, we will get the wrath. See, Paul warned Christians not to commit sin like the laws do. But if they do, does God wrath come on them? Well, in a way, you could say yes, and then you could say no. But uh, God's wrath against our sin, we know that it was all placed on Jesus. Therefore, God's wrath does not come directly or intentionally on us, even when we sin. However, but as uh, as uh, true believers, we love God and do not want to do anything to displease him. But knowing that God's wrath comes on the unbelievers for such actions that are to uh, uh, have us, we ought to be motivated not to sin. But and sometimes indirectly, we can experience the wrath of God through sin. Uh, uh, because, you know, when we think about it, uh, how, um, uh, remember how, um, uh, Lot went down, uh, it, uh, it, you know, in that, uh, where he should not have been. And remember when, uh, God got ready to, uh, uh, to, uh, bring them out, you know, he was going to, uh, he had told Abraham that he was going to destroy Sodom and, Gom and Gomorrah and see Lot had went down there and he had uh, made his home not too far out from there. And so, uh, but God uh, allowed, he was going to allow him and his family to come out uh, before his wrath was upon the people. But look at uh, all of Lot's family. God was going to allow them to go out. But look what Lot's wife did. It was because she did not want to leave. She was in so, in so in love with that lifestyle that she turned and she looked back. And what did she do? She turned to a pillar of salt. And I'm sure that that in some way or another, that, uh, that it wasn't directly wrath upon Lot. But then Lot, I'm sure he felt some type of way by his wife being uh, turned into a pillar of salt. But she was what? She was disobedient. So in other words, by way of sometimes we can uh, uh, indirectly receive the wrath of God because of our association. And so that's why we have to uh, watch who we associate with. And so uh, it's not God who punishes us, his children, when we sin. But see, our punishment has been already placed on Jesus. But sin will punish us. Therefore, we need to avoid sin as much as possible. But realize that even when we do sin, that God still loves us and he has delivered us from the wrath by placing our punishment on Jesus. But it still does not say that we will go and purposely continue to sin. Because if we purposely continue to sin, that means that something is wrong. We need to go back. And look in verse 7. He said that, Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Paul is, uh, in other words, Paul did not say that we are to stay away from all unbelievers. Uh, because we got unbelievers even in our families. But even Jesus was called a friend of publicans and sinners. Uh, when Jesus asked, why do you eat? Uh, uh, when Jesus was asked that question, why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? He answered, they that are whole need, uh, need not a physician, but they that are sick. And he said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so it's not telling us that we are not to hang around. Uh, Paul is stating here that we should not adopt the lifestyle. And the behavior of unbelievers uh, by having a part 
uh, taking a part or sharing in the what in their evil doings. And so that's what he meant about hanging around, you know, but if you around trying to minister to someone that is different, but in other words, just constantly staying uh, in, 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 you know, with them all the time and the, and you know what they're doing. And it's like, you know, you being partakers with them. No, he's saying we got to come out from among them because it's, it, it's impossible to have relationship with the lost that are positive where we are influencing them, but relationships where we are being influenced by unbelievers is unspiritually unhealthy because nine out of 10, the people, a lot of the people that, um, we used to hang with once we got saved. We eventually, we tried to stay friends with them, but we just, cause some of them we could not. Some we could minister to and we were able to bring them over uh, uh, to in this lifestyle with us. But there were some that we just could not minister to. They were more over uh, ministering to us, uh, enticing us to do uh, wrong rather than we enticing them to do what is right. So what Paul is saying here is that if their influence on you is more than your influence being on them, then it's time for you to come out. You don't need to be with them. And so that's why we got to come out from among them. It is spiritually unhealthy for us to be in a relationship whereas uh, uh, you know, the people have no regard for uh, God and they're doing any and everything because we used, used to walk in darkness. We're no longer in darkness now. So we're no longer in darkness. Why is it that we are still doing the things that those people that are walking in darkness, we're doing the same thing that they're doing. That means that we have not been changed then. And if we're doing it and we love and doing it, that's a problem. And so we need to go back. That's why we have to, we can't, uh, we, you know, we can't fellowship with them like that. Yes, you might be around them for a while, but it's like, you just can't hang out with them. You know, uh, and, and, and look in verse uh, eight. Well, that's when he said, for you were sometime darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. So we got to walk as what? Children of light. You're no longer in darkness. You got to walk as, uh, in, you know, you in the light now. And just like uh, uh, dark, I mean, light always dispels darkness. Anytime you go in a room and the light is out and it's dark in that room, the minute that you hit the light switch and turns it on, you what? The darkness is gone. That's the way it ought to be with us when we walk into a room, even though it may feel like, you know, when you first walk in, it is nothing but darkness there. But when you walk in, everybody ought to see that glow. Everybody ought to what feel that, you know, something is not, you know, she's different or he's different. Uh, they don't, they're not carrying the same kind of spirit that we got right here, you know. And then everybody there get ready to want to close down things in a hurry when you get there. In other words, Paul did not say that we were getting more and more light from the Lord, but that we are right now light in the Lord. True believers, we become light. Uh, uh, in other words, once we uh, got saved, you know, we were no longer walking in darkness. Darkness is des uh, de uh, 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 synonymous to the what to the devil, to the evil working of the devil. But the moment that we were born again. Uh, our inner man got changed. And so now we are walking in light. Uh, just like I was talking about uh, when you walk into the room. It's just like if you got uh, a, a, a bunch of cockroaches in a room. When, when you got the light is out, they'll be all out everywhere. There, where. But go and turn on that light. You'll see them scurrying and trying to get out everywhere. That's kind of the way it is when you walk in a room and there is nothing but darkness in there. Everybody in there, you know, doing their own little thing. Nobody uh, got reverence for God. Then when you walk in it, the light that's emanating from you are to cause what? Are to cause that darkness to scatter. My God, my God. That means that you're carrying something on the inside of you. You are carrying the light of God. 
Then Paul went on to say, for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Paul was promoting holiness because that's the nature of a believer. Here he gave us another reason for living godly lives. It's because the fruit of the spirit is born in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Ungodliness inhabits the growth of the fruit of the spirit in live life. That's not because God's love is conditional. His love for us is unconditional. But just as seeds cannot grow without light, so the darkness of ungodliness in our lives limits the of the production of the fruit of the spirit. See, if we cultivate a life of hatred, the fruit of love will not manifest. If we are truly born again, that love is present in our spirits, but it cannot flow while we are operating in hatred. And so, you know, these things, and we got to put these things away. You know, we've got to learn, we got to walk in truth, and we've got to walk in honesty. We've got to walk in the light. Because when we walk in the light, you know, that's what, you know, my life is, you know, in other words, I'm saying my life is like an open book. That's what we ought to be saying. You know, what you see is what you get. It's not that I'm walking this way while uh, uh, because I know you looking at me. But even when you don't see me, uh, that's what we, you know, that's what our lives should be saying. Even when... I don't see you at church on Sunday. We ought to be saying, you know what? I'm still walking in that. I still got that same walk. I still got that same talk. It should not change simply because we are not there in the midst of other believers. Even if we're not around other believers, our walk and our talks to still be one and the same. Okay, we only got down to verse 10 today. Uh, so we will take up here on, on next week. We will continue to talk about these things that Paul is saying that uh, how we shall walk. And it's no uh, mystery to us because God is not going to ask us to do something and not show us how to do it. And this is what Paul is saying. Remember uh, last week when he was telling the uh, the Gentiles, don't be like those uh, the, like the other Gentiles because you be, you've been saved now. And so once you've been saved, you are no longer, uh, uh, you are in, you know, it's one body. You are part of that body of Christ. So in other words, all Paul is saying is that we need to behave as if we are saved. Our life each and every day, you know, it just, be, it should just become a habit with us walking in truth. Walking in the things of God. Even when we mess up, we know we will we'll falter. We might slip up. But when we get up and we repent of that, but we ought not to be continuously making the same mistake over and over and over again. It's time for us to do what? To grow up in Christ and what? And be for real about our walk and our talk on this Christian journey. Amen. I hope to uh, look to see each of you Galileans on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Until then, I pray that the uh, Lord will bless you and keep you. I pray that he will make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. I pray that he will lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace in the name of Yeshua. God bless you and God keep you is my prayer.